Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And once again, we are joined by Tom Sosnoff of Tastyworks. Tom, first of all, welcome back. Happy New Year. I hope you're doing well and excited to have you back. Thanks, Tony. Happy to be back, of course. And uh, yeah, everything so far so good. I've only shot myself in the foot once or twice this year so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a good 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 way to start the year. Now we have a lot to cover here today. We really want to spend a little bit of time to go through some trade ideas, some some strategies with Tom and I. And I've specifically highlighted a few ideas that I think will provide a conversation to help you better understand some of these strategies that we trade, and also just better understand the trade-offs that you're making when you're making when you're trading these types of strategies, whether they're credit spreads or strangles, and you're choosing different expiration dates and strike prices. I think that's really the value that you know a conversation between Tom and I would be able to bring to our viewers. And then we've lined up, Tom, you know, we have over 150 users submitting questions before the webinar. So I've put together a lot of them together that I think will facilitate our our conversation here today. That's uh, great. Before... And Tony, just so you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just so you know, no. Scott and his team are on. So I know there's so many questions. So we have Scott Sheridan, who's the CEO of um, of Tastyworks, along with the, the top two risk guys that they have on the trade desk. And those guys are on right now and they're answering questions. So so Scott, Ryan and Chris are on. And so you and I can just focus on, on doing the webinar and those guys can answer any questions you have. Nothing off limits. Yeah, um, thank you so much for saying that, right? And so for example, if you have a question while we're going along, please, there's a Q&A window and there's a chat window. You can type your question into the Q&A window and the Tasty Work team will be there to help answer those questions. So thanks so much for uh, clarifying that, Tom. And thanks so much for the Tasty Work team for being on and answering your questions while Tom and I discuss these. Um, so, but before we get started, what we're gonna discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover a few different things. We're gonna do a quick introduction here, um, but we're gonna spend most of our time talking a little bit about the current market outlook and talking about some of the ideas that I wanted to flesh out on the Tastywork platform. And then for you and I to have a little conversation around how we choose the rules around entry of these strategies, the exit of these strategies. I think that's really what a lot of investors are looking for. And then we'll go through the user submitted questions and, and a live Q and A session here if we have the, if we have time here at the end. And we have a very special Tastyworks offer here for everyone um, at the very end. So before we get started, now most investors here on the session already know who you are, but Tom, I just want to give you a quick 30 seconds to talk a little bit about your background and kind of how you ended up where you are today as the co-founder and CEO of Tastyworks. Well, um, I... I... It's been a long, it's, it's been a fun journey. I'll leave it that way. I've reached a point in my life, Tony, where I get to do only the things that I want to do. And I love running Tastyworks um, and I love what we do. So I started off my career as a floor trader on the floor of the SIBO for 20 years. Um, Scott and I joined forces in like 1987, 1988, and we, we built a prop firm. Um, that means we just made markets and, and traded for ourselves and a bunch of other people with us. And then um, uh, in 1999, we built Thinkorswim. In 2009, we sold it to TD Ameritrade. 10 years later, it was a public company. Um, in 2011, we started Tasty Trade. In 2017, we started Tasty Works. And now we have the Tasty Trade um, ecosystem is Tasty Trade, Tasty Works, another brokerage firm called Doe. Um, we have the small exchange, uh, Zero Hash, which is a digital asset settlement company. Um, we have, um, uh, and, and we have a lot of other, you know, products in in house, and and um, we basically specialize in in strategic investments. So options, futures, options on futures. We're launching digital assets next week. So you name it. You know, we have it and we we love it. Fastest growing firm in in really in the world outside of outside of Robinhood, I guess. Easiest way to say it. And when you say digital assets, are you referring to cryptocurrency trading? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, awesome. when, but when we say trading, um, that's not really it's very one dimensional. We're we're gonna be offering cash 
um, digital assets. So you'll be able to trade multiple, like five, six, seven different coins, but you really can only buy them. You know, we're not offering, there's no options at this point yet in the cash market. We do offer the product from the CME, which is the BTC, which is, but it's five coins. So it's a, it's almost a $200,000 notional product. It's too big. But when we offer digital assets, we're using the cash market. So you can do $50 if you want. Awesome. That's great. That's great to hear. I'm really yep. excited to hear that. You know, we've been covering quite a bit of crypto and the moves that are currently happening. So excited to hear about that. Um, and just for those of you that uh, a little bit of entertainment value before we get started, but I can't, you know, I stress again, I would not be sitting here where I am today, running the business that I am running and being able to do exactly like you say, Tom, loving what I do if it wasn't for Tom and his team building out Thinkorswim, because I learned how to trade futures and derivatives and options from the Thinkorswim platform. It's, it, it's one of the platforms that I still use in my trading. And it's one that you know I learned from your webinars, Tom. Um, you teaching how to trade options on the Thinkorswim platform is how I got started here in this business. So uh, again, thanks to you, which is how I'm, I'm sitting that, here today. That story never gets old, Tony. You can tell it every time we're together. Great. <laughs> Um, tell it in so my let's... funeral. Tell it in my funeral too. Make sure you <laughs> make sure you do that. I will. I absolutely will. Um, so let's let's start off by talking a little bit about the market outlook. And and actually, largely the markets have not changed a whole lot since the last time you and I spoke. The last time we spoke, the queues were Ivy Rank was about twenty percent. We're at twenty one percent right now. Uh, queues were just about three hundred at the time, just shy of three hundred. We've now broken above that level and continue to grind our way higher as as kind of status quo in the current market conditions that we're in. But we have we've had that break. Out. Momentum is still relatively neutral here and not overly uh, overextended here on the queues. Um, so first of all, before we kind of move on to, to the, the rest of the market, what's your view on the broader markets here you know, at the current moment? Well, I, I, I haven't changed just, just as you just said, like, you know, as much as time goes by, sometimes things haven't changed that much. My, my view hasn't changed. I am, I am cautiously short. So what that means here is that um, I have stayed short premium on balance, which is short implied volatility on balance, because I think there's a lot of call skew out there. There's a lot of rich premium. And as a protective measure, I'm short deltas on top of that, which, which essentially means to people that are listening to kind of, you know, option speak for the first time, I am essentially short stocks and short option premium. And it's kind of like a package. So I'm expecting the market maybe volatility to stay in a very narrow range. The, 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 vol, the vol curve right now, Tony, the, the, the forward looking vol curve is actually higher. It takes us from current levels up to about 24, 25 over the next five or six months. So the marketplace is not anticipating a lot of volatility contraction. Um, I am short bonds and they've, been, and they've been going down. I am flat crypto here. Um, and as far as the major markets are concerned, I'm primarily short the NASDAQ. Um, that would be my ma major short. And I have a tiny bit of short after today in the, I, in the Russell. I'm flat the Dow and I'm flat the S&Ps. Interesting. So uh, I, I think that's actually a good segue into the, the next conversation, which is the slow rotation that we've started to see here into small caps, into value out of growth. You know, so your short uh, ND, uh, your short NASDAQ position kind of, in my opinion, correlates with that view of that rotation out of growth. Um, but we've seen the rotation into value. So you're, you've, you're also short small caps as well, as well as technology. Is that correct? Um, I'm small, short, small caps only because, so my view on small caps is not about value. Um, and I don't want to spend, I don't want to go off track here, but my view on the small cap index is the small cap index has a direct inverse relationship with interest rates and with mm -hmm. the, what's happening currently. The small cap, the Russell, which when we say small cap, we're talking about IWM. The small mm -hmm. cap index, um, as interest rates go higher, the small cap goes higher because it is being fueled by financial stocks and financial stocks, asset gatherers, asset collectors love higher interest rates. It drops, it means more money drops to the bottom line instantaneously. So the financial stocks like JP Morgan, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, um, and you know, Schwab, th things like that, just anybody that gathers assets, these stocks have been super strong, pushing the Russell index dramatically higher. 
And I think they're a little overdone. That's all. Uh, there's no doubt about how extended IWM is um, from a small cap. And I certainly understand wanting to fade that. Um, so, I mean, that also leads to the, you know, now that we're talking about rates, the sell-off in, in treasuries, right? If we look at TLT, um, mm -hmm. severely oversold, looks like we had a bit of a small bounce here today. You know, what's your view on rates? Because from my perspective, you know, when we look at the 10-year yield today, we hit about 117, 118 basis points on the 10-year. Uh, you know, are you concerned about the Fed moving their purchasers purchases a little further out on the curve and perhaps bringing that interest rate down a little? Because that that's one of my concerns. And I'm actually long TLT, not not through uh, an op. I, I'm actually short the puts or, or put spreads rather mm -hmm. on TLT, um, just simply because it's so severely oversold looking for a small bounce here. I'm curious as to your views on, on treasuries and why sure. you think that it's going to continue. I'm, I'm very opinionated in the treasury market. Um, the First of all, I do agree with you. I want to start off by saying I agree with you. And I went home a little bit. Um, uh, I, I went home a little bit long the, um, uh, the, the 10 year note tonight. But that said, uh, I think I think the 10 year and the 30 year and everything else, every, everything interest rate related is grossly oversold on a very short term basis. But with any kind of longer perspective, I believe the world is still completely long and the convexity risk, the convexity risk is essentially principal risk. The principal risk in the bond market right now is greater to me than the stock market risk. And I just don't, I can't envision a scenario other than a stock, other than a huge flight to quality, which I don't think you're going to see. Um, I can't envision a scenario where, where I could get bullish on, on bond prices at this point, other than a short-term bounce from oversold. I think the biggest risk of an utter failure in, a, in any kind of market where there's a lot of notional um, longs is the bond market. I think it's, in fact, I think the bond market has a bigger risk of crash than the stock market. Interesting. That's a, that's a, a, you know, so I think a lot of investors feel uh, sort of uh, kind of the opposite. And perhaps that's why you've taken uh, a bit of a contrarian view here on that front. And, and I like hearing that. Um, so what adjustments have you made to your portfolio this particular week, if, if any, you know, given the, the changes that you've seen in the markets? So I've been playing a little defense. Um, I mean, what I've, what I've made money in this week is, well, here, I'll, I'll put it this way. We have some directional plays on right now, and some have worked and some have not. I mean, we were short Tesla yesterday, and, and I've been short Tesla, but but I think that Tesla is one of the great shorts on the board, and it was down $70 yesterday, up $50 or $45 today. Um, I That stock has been very volatile. In the markets, we had a really good day today on, on the premium erosion front, because everything they crushed today, premium-wise, but there were individual stocks that had gigantic moves that we got caught in. For example, Baidu, for example, Plug, you know, things like that. They've just had, you know, out, a stitch fix, another example. So there are a bunch of stocks that had some outside, outside moves. There are some, there's some big call skews around on individual stocks right now. So the indexes have been fairly stable, but the, but some of these individual stocks have really had, you know, gigantic moves with huge call skew. That's very interesting that, you know, you're, as you say, cautiously bearish on the markets while we have a cautiously bullish view on the markets. And we've been, we've been positioning ourselves by being relatively light in terms of the number of long positions that we are holding in mm -hmm. this current market condition and taking profits quite early on a lot of the names. Uh, you know, as soon as they trigger your, the take profit levels, we're taking profits on it just to keep our sure. long exposure light because we are concerned about a short-term pullback because we've had a pretty extended move here to the upside. It really reminds me very much of how we started 2020, which was uh, overextended, continue to slow grind here to the upside and just waiting for a catalyst to, to, to yeah. potentially spark a, a move here to the downside. Yeah, I think that the the forward curve in the VIX starting to go up so dramatically in February kind of me, makes me think that there's there's at least a few percentage points or maybe greater correction coming. And maybe it's just the fact that we're just overdone and maybe it's the fact, you know, to the upside or, or maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm just going to be dead wrong. But I... I, I feel like we're extended here and I feel like there's a there's a decent pot odds, you know, for a downside play, but I don't think we're going anywhere. 
So in other words, this is not something where we're setting up for, you know, for some kind of crazy, you know, multi-standard deviation move. I do not think we will see repeat a repeat of what we saw in two, in 2020, but I do think that 2021, from an historical perspective, is going to be a, a great trading year because they're going to have heightened volatility the entire year. I just don't think we're going to see any of the craziness that we saw in 2020. 2020 was a remarkable year for given, you know, the volatility ranges. I don't think we see that in 2021, but I do think compared to historical numbers, we see a lot of two-sided trade this year. Yeah. Um, and from my perspective, I, I do think that there is one major difference in terms of how markets sit at the beginning of 2021 versus the beginning of 2020 is actually that rate curve that you're talking about. The, the fact that going out five, six months in the VIX rate curve is still elevated, I think speaks to the fact that investors are uh, are not sleeping at the wheel, if you will, that I, that I feel investors were, were a bit sleeping at the wheel at the beginning of 2020. Um, we didn't have that elevated rate curve, which I think exacerbated some of the perhaps sell off here. I think investors are, are much have their eye on the ball this time. Um, and I think a lot of investors have the same concern. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, 2020 woke a lot of people up and myself included. And the level of complacency right now is very different than it was a year ago. And I completely agree with you. Yeah. So let's explore some some actual trades. And I think this is a good way for us to have a conversation around, um, you know, at the end of the day, when you trade options, you have a lot of different options. And Tom and I many times talk about what we consider optimal starting points for a lot of these types of strategies. But many times you have to make small adjustments to these, depending on whether you're uh, bullish or bearish, uh, whether you're overly bearish, I'm sorry, strongly bullish, or maybe mildly bullish, or different, just, you know, different scenarios that you may come across cross. And, you know, many times we look at selling credit spreads as a strategy. This is this is one of our favorite strategies. This is one of our strategies that we use the most in 2020, given the fact of the elevated implied volatilities that we've been able to capture. So a good example of this, you know, Tom, last time you were on, we talked about selling a credit spread on Zoom when it was oversold. Mm -hmm. And this time I'm looking at a very similar setup here in FedEx, which has had a very strong run to the upside, has pulled back about 15% from those highs and has certainly reached what we would consider from a technical perspective oversold. Um, we know that there's likely going to be a permanent shift to e-commerce and that's FedEx has built a very strong both ground network as well as overnight business that is extremely strong. And we think, and I think that there's a bit of a, um, a um, disparity right now between where the stock is trading and, and the in and this and both the technicals and the fundamentals. So I wanted to look at selling a credit spread here on FDX. And I specifically thought that this was a good way for us to have a conversation around how to pick different strike prices, because you and I have slightly different um, starting points as far as strike prices. So I think I want to talk through you know, what are the differences? What are the trade-offs that you're making when you sell something that's more at the money that we would use than something slightly more out of the money that you, that you would use? So Tom, if you don't mind, if you could share your screen, we can use Tastyworks and we can uh, take a look at this type of uh, setup here and just to walk investors through kind of our thought process. Um, sure. So I think I should be... There you go. Um, can Perfect. you see the screen now? Yep. Okay, so let's just type in FedEx just for fun. And so so first of all, this is the down move over here, Tony, that yep. you're seeing here. So when you yep. say we've had a little bit of a sell-off in Federal Express, yeah, you have. <laughs> um, this has been a huge sell-off and that's that's a little, you know, that's, that's short-term ugly. We would both agree with that. And I do, I, I mean, I know it was up $4 today, but I agree with you. It's an interesting spot here to play FedEx um, a little bit from the long side. Completely agree. So on Tasty, um, we'll go, we'll now, you know, I mean, I'll take you through how I do it and then we can listen to how, however you do it. I go to the nearest of 45 days um, and it is 38 days. But remember when, when I talk about trading, I base everything off implied volatility rank. So I use that as for context. I use that to, to, to basically set me up for the type of spread I'm going to do. And notice the IV rank here is only 10, 10.9. So it's very low. FedEx has plenty of volume. It's obviously has plenty of liquidity. Um, and you can see the option volume in here is, you know, there's, there's, 
enough for what we consider this to be, you know, a liquid underlying. Now, the only problem with FedEx having an IV rank of under, that just measures IV on a scale of one to 100 of 10 is that we would probably go um, credit spread. I'm sorry, we'd probably go debit spread as opposed to credit spread. That's the only difference. And that's just more of a mechanical thing. So if I wanted to, you know, like, let's say, I agree with Tony here. I think the stock is oversold. It had a nice little bounce today. If I wanted to get long the stock here, I buy the 240 calls and I sell the 245 calls. I do debit spreads at the money. I do credit spreads out of the money and debit spreads at the money. So my first choice here would be to buy the 240, 250 at around, let's call it five and a half bucks. I like to pay about 50% of the width of the strikes, but in this case, it would be a little bit higher. But don't forget, if you pay $5.65 intrinsically right now, it's worth $8.50. So you're not paying any additional premium to buy this. So I kind of like that as a, that would be my debit spread of choice to get long FedEx here. Now, if I had to do a credit spread and wanted to do a credit spread, I would go to somewhere around kind of one or two strikes out of the money. In this case, I'd like to collect around one third the width of the strikes. So let's see the 230, 220 is about $2. That's a little low. So just based on our own mechanics, I would go up to the 240, 230 for $3.10. That's about one third the width of the strikes. And that's where I would be credit spread wide. So credit spread, I would sell the 230, the 240, 230 put spread. Um, and I would do that normally if the IV rank was a little higher. Debit spread, I would buy the 240, 250. And that's only because of our mechanics. They're virtually the same thing. In theoretical terms, they're virtually the same thing. They're synthetic equivalents. I'm glad that you brought that up. So, and 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 I'm glad that you that you walked us through this because in in reality, my position that I actually have in FedEx myself is a debit spread because of this very reason. I wanted to take a look at the credit spread because I wanted to walk users through kind of our, the differences in how we pick strike prices, but let's come back to the credit spread. Let's talk about the debit spread first, okay? okay? So sure. you chose the 240, 250 spread, which as you said, was trading at about five and a half bucks um, with an intrinsic value of about eight at the time. Now, the position that I currently have in my portfolio is I'm long the 250 and I'm short the 280s. Now, okay. this is partially because I have a very strong directional view on FedEx. Not only do I have a strong uh, technical view, I have a strong fundamental view. I believe FedEx and, and mine go out to March, not February, just because I, I typically, when I use a debit spread, I go a little further out in time to reduce um, the time decay or, or the, the, the um, theta on the overall trade. But I'm trading a, a vertical spread because it gives me the convexity from the 250 trade, the, the hockey stick, if, you're, if you will, that you're looking for when you're looking for a long call. But you want to offset some of that uh, decay because if you just buy call options, that many times you're paying a lot in terms of time decay. As you like to put it, you have to beat the stock in order to in order to make sense to buy a call option. It's tough to beat the stock. So one of the ways to offset you know the premium that you have to pay is to sell an, an out of the money call option here. And because you know my targets here on, on FDX are in back into the 280 290 range. That's why I've chosen the 250, 280 um, debit spread. But I want to walk investors through kind of the difference between a 250, 280 spread and maybe a 250, 260 spread um, or 240, 250 spread that you would use and just kind of the trade-offs that you're making between the two strategies. Well, okay. I'll tell you what my logic is and then you can go through your logic. So, sure. so the 240, 250, obviously the... the Buying an at-the-money debit spread is basically a 50-50 shot. This one's a little less than 50-50, but 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 um, but it's basically a 50, a little greater than 50-50. I'm sorry, but it's basically a 50-50 shot. And I only buying it here because the IV ranks so low. Normally, I would go for the credit spread and a higher than 50-50 shot. But in this case here, the reason I like the 240 250 is because when you look at the expected move in this particular stock, I want to set myself up for the best chance of success. And the reason I like the 240, 250 is one, I'm paying no extrinsic at all in there. Okay. Because there's, because it's actually, it, if we close right here, you know, in, at a certain period of time in the future, it's actually worth more than I'm paying for it. So I'm actually, I'm collecting, this is positive decay. 
usually, you know, people, some people go, well, the reason I don't like to buy debit spreads is because I don't like to buy any premium. But in this case here, you're actually collecting money. You're short premium. See this theta number here? This is money every single day. We make $3 a day on this trade. So it's got positive theta for buying a credit spread. That's pretty rare. But anyway, that's one of the reasons I like it. The other reason I like it is because up here, this is the expected move over the course of the next 38 days. And it's $18. And if you look at the stock and you think about, hey, where do I maximize my profit on this credit spread? You always want the expected move, okay, to be outside of your um, of your short of your short strike in a long credit spread. So I'm buying the 240, I'm selling the 250. If I do that, and I just think about that from you know wherever I am, I want this particular stock and the expected moves eighteen dollars higher or lower from where it is today. That takes it up to 265. Let's just say. That's outside of my short strike. And that's where I want the expected move to potentially be if I'm right directionally, if my assumption is correct. So the three reasons why I'm doing the debit spread, one, because I'm actually collecting um, positive theta Two, the IV rank is low. And three, because the expected move is outside of my short strike. That's, that's a very interesting take on debit spreads. You know, I use the 250, 280s. Uh, again, Here, I'm going to set yours up for you. 250, 280, right there. Right. Um, I'm doing it because, first of all, my buying power, I'm sorry, this, this spread is $8.40, right. which is a relatively small percentage of the stock price. I think you can think of my strategy as more of a stock replacement strategy with a uh, relatively tight stop, if you will, on, this, on, the, on the stock itself, risking a relatively small percentage of the stock playing for that extended move here to be upside. So both strategies are suitable if you have a bullish view here on FedEx, I just happen to have I, uh, what you would probably consider a very bullish view here on FedEx to use a much wider vertical as, you, as you're doing here. But I think the trade-off that you're making here is because I'm paying $8.40. Uh, the break-even price on the stock is $2.58. So FedEx has to move up to at least $2.58 by February expiration for this strategy to be profitable versus Tom's trade. Even if FedEx stays where it is, you will actually gain premium. But, but what, what you said is relatively rare. You rarely see a debit spread that has positive theta. Um, but most of them, uh, when you use an at the money um, spread as you, as you have selected, um, generally speaking, the theta is closer to zero. Yep, you're right. Um, so let's let's take a look at the credit spreads. Let's say for, for argument's sake that the IV rank on this was relatively high. And I did want to use the weekly options just because there are more strikes. And I want to use that as, an, as a way to, to um, uh, show uh, you know, how we select strike prices. And I know that, Tom, you prefer to trade the monthly options because it helps you organize your portfolio. Right? right. You, you want to not necessarily have to deal with weekly expirations and figuring out all your roles. And that makes perfect sense for someone who has, as yourself, a lot of different positions in your portfolio. Um, for many investors who maybe only have a handful of positions, you may find sometimes in the weekly options that there are more strikes that you can trade. So you can fine tune the specific deltas. And I tend to find that when you're trading credit spreads, being able to fine tune the exact delta that you're looking for um, really helps from, from that perspective. So Tom, why don't you walk everyone through, let's just for argument's sake, assume that the IV rank on FedEx was higher and you would okay. find it suitable to sell a credit spread. How would you go about finding your strike prices? Cause you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I would use in this particular case when FedEx is around 249, I would use the 250, 235 roughly strike prices on the credit spread here. Okay. So, so for me now, again, the difference here, Tony, is that, that I originally looked at the February and they only had 10 point wide strikes. Right. So that's why I selected the 240 and the 230 because that particular short credit spread um, is about one third the width of the strikes, $3 and 10 cents. That's the only thing I use is to collect, you know, somewhere around between 30 and 35% of the width of the strikes. I'll go to whatever strikes I have to, to get to that number. OK, mm -hmm. I don't like to sell in the money because I want to be collecting premium. So I want it to be slightly out of the money. In this case, it's eight dollars out of the money. As you can see here, this theta number is positive. That's what I want. But if I was to clear this. And if I was to go to the weeklies, like you said a second ago and open up February, now the weeklies have two and a half dollar wide strikes. 
So there's a lot more choices. You don't have to do something $10 wide. You can choose something else. So in this case, I would probably go a couple strikes out of the money. Let's just say we went down um, in, in, I just did the 240, 230 before, and you said $15 wide. Was that what you wanted to do? Or what, what was it? Yeah. So in this particular case, I think I'd sell the 247 and a half, which is the first out of the money strike. And I would buy back roughly the 230, uh, 230, I would say. So 12 and a half dollars. Okay. So uh, you mean the, the, no, that would be 17 and a half. 247 and a half, 230? Yeah, sorry, 17 and a half. My, my... 17 and a half, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so that is perfect. $6.15 is almost perfect, you know, one third the width of the strikes, right? So it's eight, $18, we one third the width of the strike. This is 17 and a half. So it's, it's almost perfect at one third the width of the strikes. This is exactly the same logic that we would use. The only thing that I'll mention here, Tony, and this is what I would caution you about, in this case, and this is using the weeklies that are perfect 45 days out, is, and, and this is the only thing that pops up that bothers me about this trade, is if you can see these markets here, these are $3 wide, these are $4 wide, and only a 20 lot of, has traded all day. When I go back and I look at the regular FEBs, okay, and I look at the ones we're looking at, you know, a couple hundred traded here, a couple hundred traded here, and, um, and these markets, are only 50, 60 cents wide. So the only thing that concerns me is not, is not the approach that you're taking. I'm fine with this spread collecting one third of the width of strikes. What scares me is the $3 wide markets or the $4 wide markets and the no volume. So this is just a function of liquidity, nothing else. I'm glad that you brought that up. And this is something that we typically see many times with newly listed weekly options. FedEx is a perfectly uh, liquid name for perfectly liquid underlying. But when you, when you have these newly listed options, these weekly options, we tend to see wider spreads until a bit of volume picks up here. So sometimes on a trade like this, I would wait a couple of days, see more contracts trade. We usually see these uh, weekly options tighten up pretty pretty tight by 43, 42 days to expiration. Um, and that's when I typically would enter this trade. But you're absolutely right. When you see these very wide spreads, um, this is usually something that is, uh, you know, you want to be careful on when you're trading. Um, but, I, but I was hoping that you'd be able to walk investors through, you know, it, let's just say things weren't so wide. You know, what deltas do you typically choose? Because I know you usually have a slightly different starting point in terms of deltas. So so my starting point is usually around the 35 Delta. So for me, my starting point would be around the 240 strike. Um, and I don't care what strike you buy. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like mm -hmm. I, I only care about what strike you sell. A couple of little tidbits of information here that I think are important. One, and, and this is great for everybody listening, no matter what kind of spreads, you, no, matter, no matter what kind of spreads you do. The first one is that if you're ever looking at a stock like FedEx, like this, like these particular weeklies, and the markets are a little wide, like they're three or four dollars wide, never do a non-spread order. And the reason I say this is because I'm going to show you a little trick here. The the I'm going to change the quantity to one. Okay. When I do a quantity of one here, and let's just say I did a 240, 230 spread, right? Quantity of one. Um, What's interesting about this is you can see the delta here between the, the 240s and the 230s. This is 36 delta. This is 24 delta. With only 12 shares of stock between the two of these, the counterparty, whoever's taking the other side of this trade, which is a, which is a machine, doesn't have to really hedge that position. So they'll make a market that's relatively close to theoretical value. So let's just say in this case, let me give you an example. Let me clear this. And I'm going to sell the 240 and I'm going to buy the 230, okay? Now, you can see down here that the, the um, oops, let me just do it one contract. So one contract, the delta is just 12. It's 11 point, whatever, 96 or something. So that means it's only the equivalent of 12 shares of stock. This is a very simple trade for the counterparty to trade it right around this mid price, maybe three, four cents off this mid price. However, if you went in, let's just say, for example, and you're super bullish and you just want to sell these puts outright, you're going to end up somewhere in the middle between 11 and a half at 11 and a half and seven and a half. And you're going to be probably a dollar or two away from theoretical, you know, from, from a real theoretical mid price, and you're going to get a crappy fill. So if you ever see wide markets, always do a spread. If you have narrow markets, you have a lot more choices, 
But if you have wide markets like that, always do a spread. And to answer your first question, Tony, my default is usually in the mid thirties, Delta wise. Right. Um, so you would sell, let's say the 240 and maybe buy back the 230s, 270, 227 and a half. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Something, something just like this here. This spread is $12 wide collecting, you know, just under $4. I'd be fine with that. That's a little under 30%. Right. So I, I think the, the difference is that our strategies, uh, you know, have a, a slight, has a slightly more bullish tilt to it, if you will, by selling yeah. that at the money, giving us a little less protection. But the trade-off that we're making is that we'll usually collect, in our example, 35, 36% of the spread. Um, and what we're, what we're effectively risking is a little less than twice the premium that we're collecting versus when you go slightly out of the money, you tend to risk a little bit more than twice the income that you receive. That's a trade-off that you're making when you make these choices as a trader, um, You know whether you're selling something that's closer to the at the money or slightly out of the money. It really is that trade-off between risk reward and probabilities. And that's that's really all your that's that's really the decision that you're making all day long when you're trading options is what trade-off do you want to make between probabilities and risk reward. And that's well said. And the other thing we should point out to everybody is there is no right answer. Like like what Tony does as opposed to what I do, they're they're both theoretically what we consider to be high probability trades and to be and to be statistically, you know, significant in their approach. Like there's not, you know, one is not better than the other. Just like Tony said, it's a trade-off between between probability and credit received. So it's a trade-off between potential max profit and probability of success. That's all it is. Right. Um, and I think that's really important for investors and, and traders who are, who are learning how to trade options to understand because I, I see too many investors asking questions about, you know, this is the one strategy that works all the time. Why don't you trade this? Why don't you trade that? And the answer is, if you feel that your strategy is best, it chances are you might be missing half the picture. You know, a lot of investors that prioritize high probability of success trades many times are lacking the other side of the picture, which is the very, very poor risk to reward that you typically see with these very, very high probability trades. And we actually have a question regarding, regarding this um, in, a, in a few minutes here, Tom. Cool, cool. Um, so the next one I wanted to take a look at, which actually highlights this IV rank um, issue uh, 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 indicator that you just brought up, were two, two symbols that are actually relatively similar to each other in terms of volatility. The two trades, the two symbols that I'm looking at are NEO and Pinterest. Um, and what I've noticed is that both on NEO and Pinterest, if you sold a February at the money straddle, now, Pinterest and Neo have very different IV ranks, um, but both very volatile and price points that are relatively similar to each other. Uh, Pinterest in IV rank of about 55 mm -hmm. and Neo with an IV rank of in the, I think it was 12 or 13 that you were just yeah, looking at. Yeah, 12 or 13, right. Um, yet both of these strategies, if you sold a February at the money straddle, would collect roughly about 20% of the underlying stock's price. Um, so if you sold a $75 straddle, that's $17.50, which is a little, actually a little bit more than I believe um, $17.45 divided by 75 is 23% of the underlying stock's price. Um, so a fair amount of premium that you're collecting on something with uh, an at the money straddle. And if we do the same thing for NEO, um, very different IV ranks, but very similar uh, in terms of what you'd collect on an at the money. So I think the at the money's now is probably close to 60 bucks. So you're collecting $8 and sorry, um, $15 and yeah. 20 cents yeah. on a $62 stock. That's roughly 24%. So both 23, 24% that you're collecting on this at the money straddle, but very different IV ranks. How do you look at these two trades? And if you were trading, I know which one you would probably prefer based on IV rank, but could you walk investors through a little bit, kind of your thought process, you know, because it, on the surface, when you look at this, two look very similar to each other, but the different yes. Ivy ranks may result in very different outcomes. Yeah. So um, the way the statistics break down, and this is really interesting, and we've done a ton of research on this. If the Ivy rank is super low, like it is in NEO, you actually have a negative, there's, there's, not, a, there's not a positive edge if you were selling a straddle. If you're buying it, it's something different. But if you're selling the straddle like we're looking at right now, 
you actually have a slightly negative edge to theoretical of selling it with the IV rank this low, meaning that over time, there's a statistical chance that it will rally a little bit more than it will sell off as far as the premium levels are concerned. So for me, the only determining factor, assuming that both are liquid, and NEO is more liquid than PINs, but PINs is definitely liquid enough. With a 12 IV rank, I have to pass on selling this strangle. Now, remember, this has 113, 114% implied volatility, but on a relative basis, the potential for this, for these two options to contract is not nearly as good as the potential here. So what's interesting, and I'm just quoting from memory right now, but when you have an IV rank of 55, you get to a point where you're four times more likely to see volatility contraction here on this 75 um, straddle, then you are four times more likely in pins to see contraction than you are in NEO. Now, obviously, I don't know what's going to happen in either stock. And just like Tony said, they're priced around the same way. But I like the pot odds of having four times better chance of having volatility contraction as opposed to expansion. So the, the IV rank here is, is great too. I mean, the IV is great here too. It's 91 as opposed to 113. They're both super high. The volume is about half. It's 8.9 instead of, you know, 18.9, whatever. So, but they're still super liquid, both of them. And I'm a no brainer to default to pins in this case, as opposed to Neo. Perfect. I think that's exactly what we were uh, looking for is, is a little, a little, um, view into kind of how you're viewing these straddles, because I think a lot of investors looking at these types of straddles will say, okay, both of these are collecting roughly 23, 24% of the underlying stock price, which means that the stock needs to make a fairly significant move for these strategies to effectively uh, go beyond their break-even levels. Um, how do you determine, or how do you decide between the two which ones you trade. And I think that's perfect in terms of how you explained it. Um, so Tom, let's let's switch over to some questions here that I think are really going to be useful in helping investors better understand, you know, not only the platform, but also just. You know, what's good, Tony, here on the platform, just to, just to show you this, because this is a great example in Pinterest. When you look at this here, do you see this green area in here? Mm -hmm. That is the expected move. So one of the cool things about Tastyworks is we put a straddle up in here, right? So you can see collecting $17.40. On the same page, we show you the delta. Let me just change this to a one lot so it makes it more simpler. So you see the delta, it's pretty flat, just short, your short equivalent of 12 deltas. And you collect $21 a day on this position. This dotted line here is the one standard deviation move. And this is the expected move. So it's kind of cool. You can see it all in front of you. So like mm -hmm. you can visualize it. Um, you can visualize it. And if you wanted to take this just to see it inside of a distribution curve, you could do that as well here. But again, it doesn't fit that well on this particular Zoom interface, but yeah, you can see a little bit. Oh, I'll center it. Close enough. And these are this is a put in a call. They're both standing next to each other. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, it's it's okay. So let's turn to some questions here because I, I think a lot of, you know, over 150 people submitted questions. I tried to take out some of the ones that I thought were useful. But before we start with the questions, the number one asked question, Tom, as has been for the last few sessions that we've been on is really, have there been any updates on the progression of Tastyworks Canada. A lot of questions are regarding, you know, the, the there are a lot of Canadians looking for more options trading tools, looking for the advanced tools that you guys are showing for Canadian investors. So any, any updates? I spend, the only thing that keeps me up at night is Canada and it drives me out of my mind. I just spent a whole, a whole day over the weekend filling out forms for the Canadian regulators. Um, hopefully, as soon as we can get to Canada, we can complete the process. Right now, the borders are closed and we have in-person requirements. Um, we also have to get to um, and work with our clearing firms in Canada to make sure we can launch, you know, with, with all the products. So I don't have a, like, we're just stuck in the mud. Um, Canada is one of the few countries in the world where we cannot take a customer, even a non-solicited customer. I know it sounds crazy, but all over the world, China, Russia, 
anywhere in South America, anywhere in Europe, anywhere basically 100 and uh, I mean, out of 195 countries, I think we can take customers from, you know, 65 or 70 countries. But the one the one place we cannot take a customer that's non solicited, meaning we can't solicit or non solicited is Canada because of the way their regulations are written. So we have to get licensed in Canada. We've been in the process now for just about two years. And then I mean, we would have been done except for the pandemic. Um, I, it's I Tony, I, I'd love to give it I'd love to tell everybody it'd be next Wednesday, but it's not. And I just don't I, know the answer. Well, I mean, keep plugging away. I know we're going to get there. And we have a lot of customers that will be right there when you guys launch. We have our largest you the most viewers we have for our network outside of the US is Canada, Canada and India are about tied. And we want to get to Canada, you know, a year ago, it's ridiculous, but we just can't complete the process. It's very frustrating. Well, like I said, looking forward to it, and we'll, we'll make sure we update everyone once Tasty sure. Works Canada launches. Uh, so let's let's dive into some of these questions here. And Pradeep asks, uh, I think, what is a great question? And you know, he says both Tom and Tony suggesting edit, edit, exiting a credit spread at 21 days before expiration. Uh, however, butterflies are effectively a combination of. He said debit and credit spreads, but it's actually two credit spreads together, which will give you a max profit closer to expiration. What's your strategy for entering butterflies and taking profits? So he's referring to the 21 day rule that we have with credit spreads and whether that applies to butterflies. The 21 day rule with credit spreads and debit spreads is, is a very marginal, it's a mar we call it marginal optimization. It's the same thing as if is if you're a gambler and you're playing blackjack and you hit on 12. You know, it's a, it's a very small marginal edge to hit on 12. It's the same thing with, you know, with making the adjustment at 21 days on credit or debit spreads. Now, that said, um, I butterflies are a different animal because butterflies don't start to open up and widen. And we're not talking about brokering butterflies here. Brokering butterflies are essentially credit spreads. So we're talking about like a traditional one by two by one um, equidistant away. And those are those I don't actually, even though they are two verticals, I don't consider those necessarily to be, you know, I don't look at those as if they are debit and credit spreads. I look at them as it's going to take until a couple of days before expiration for them to widen out. Those are what we call long shots. And any butterfly is... Has, has a fractional, you know, it's a very small percentage probability of profit. So if you want to do that, you're pretty much going to have to wait until expiration week, two, three days, not to the last day or the day before that, but two, three days before expiration. Um, I, and, and anyone who's ever traded a butterfly knows that, you know, many times you're just sitting on there until that last week or so before you either. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. Uh, Exactly. Um, it's a very low pro and, and, you know, as again, uh, with the conversation around probabilities and risk to reward problem from butterfly perspective, very, very strong risk to reward, but very low probability. Um, the next question from Mike. And Tony, uh, a great way to figure out your probability of success on a butterfly is even to make like a couple pennies is just to take the in basically the inverse of what you pay for it um, divided by the width of the strikes. So if you pay 50 cents for something that's five dollars wide, it's about a 10% chance of, of working. That, that's a, that's a nice little back of the envelope calculation. And this is, this is what, this is what guys used to have to do before platforms like Tastyworks and options play exist. And we have to manually calculate our, our probabilities and odds. Um, I did uh, a and, lot and, of manual calculation in my lifetime. I promise you. Yeah. And anyone who's played poker or blackjack, you know, has the same has, has done the same. Um, so moving on, Mike is saying, do you feel it's important to close out all trades on expiration day, regardless of something being out of the money, or I'm, I'm guessing what he means is regardless of something has a very high probability of success. And, and I think this is a, a, you know, something that we have seen a few blow ups here over the past uh, couple of months. So Tom, I'm, I'm love to hear your thoughts here. First of all, I, I'm guessing you don't hold a lot of things to expiration, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this just as best practice. Okay, as a best practice, there is virtually, unless you have something that is a full loser, and we're talking about max loss, unless you have something that is at max loss or a full loser, there is no reason for you to hold anything to expiration day in this day and age. And, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. 
One, obviously some of the ETFs have dividends the day before and you could get stuck with something. But the other reason is the way stocks move around in 2020 and 2021, there are a lot of crazy moves. Something can move five, 10, 15, $20 at the end of the day. Brokerage firms have no interest in taking expiration risk. And a lot of times the firms are either gonna close you out of your positions or you potentially could get caught in between strikes. And there's no advantage to it unless you're unless you are locked out of the trade with no chance for success. You just hold it because it's a free shot. I think there is absolutely no reason to hold something into expiration. There's no there's no mathematical support for it at all. The gamma risk is high. The the other risks are enormous. I just don't see any reason. And there's no commissions to close anything. It doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Um, you know, 2020, I, I think there's a couple of big losses that we had seen from clients. Um, you know, one Nike recently reported on Friday, uh, you know, after the close, that was an odd one um, that caused, uh, you know, Nike to jump after hours and some clients got caught in that. But that wasn't a big move. The big one was Biogen when FDA um, didn't approve their drug. Wow, stock had halted. A lot of investors still think of, you know, it's, they're only concerned about where the stock closes on Friday. But in reality, what you need to worry about is where can the stock open on Monday? That is really what determines whether someone is going to exercise a short call or put that you might own. And many times you have a credit spread, you feel that the credit spread's about to expire worthless. So you leave it and you just, Instead of paying the, uh, and, and at Tastyworks, if I'm not mistaken, there are no costs to close out a, a, a trade. So there's no reason from a, from a transaction perspective not to do it. And, you know, we saw a client that lost over $600,000 when they max loss on the credit spread was only $21,000 because of where the stock opened on Monday, not where it closed on Friday. So always, yeah. there's mm -hmm. no reason to hold the trade to expiration. Stocks. Um, the, the cash markets close at three o'clock central time. And, but you can exercise up until 325. So what happens is in the post market, if the stock moves like, you know, one, one afternoon on a Friday afternoon, um, you know, some a stock like Tesla moved $30 once. So you could be, you could think you're $30 safe. And the next thing you know, you know, the stock moves $30 after hours. And, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of an exercise risk. There's no reason to take that risk. Zero, zero, zero. So just get out of that stuff. You know, just close it out ahead of time. Anything. I close everything out 21 days. I'm never even in that situation unless I have a max loss. And which means I sold a credit spread for $5. The stock is trading $20 higher right now. I'm max loss. I just, you know, there's nothing I can do. I'll just hold it. But generally speaking, always close out your trades prior to expiration and don't deal with it. Move on. Yep. Um, I, I can't tell you how, how much of a headache expiration is for, for, for if, you're, if you're holding it to expiration. You can avoid that entirely by rolling your positions well ahead of time. Um, so Jerry is asking the next question, which actually doesn't have anything to do with options, but I thought it was a great question. And his question was, to av avoid any unexpected margin increases in terms of buying power during market turmoil on a margin account, is it a better approach to trade leverage ETFs such as TQQQ or TNA? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that, Tom, if you're looking for leverage? First of all, um, Jerry, it's a, it's a great question. But if you're looking for leverage, those um, leveraged ETFs don't give you any leverage. They almost all trade near max cash value. So um, because, because the clearing firms and the brokerage firms don't give you much leverage on leveraged ETFs to start with. And the chances of changing margin midstream on individual equities is very rare. You'll see it happen occasionally on hard to borrow stocks and you'll see it happen occasionally around crazy binary events. But for the most part, over the last 12 years, we've changed margin rates midstream maybe three or four times. That's it in like 10, 12 years. The real risk of margin rates changing is if you're trading futures, options, or futures. Futures, options, the, span, the way span margining works, which is a different margining system, if you're trading futures options, like on Tastyworks, you can trade stock options or futures options. And if you're trading futures options, as you get close to expiration, they have a gamma risk component. And so the, the span margining will increase your capital requirement. As you get close to expiration, it, it, actually, it actually moves in real time. But on the security side, like with any equity index or ETF, they virtually never move. 
That, that's great to know. Um, and a lot of investors, you know, ask about trading these leverage ETFs. I'm personally not a huge fan of them because they only provide leverage over a single trading day. They actually have quite a bit of tracking record, uh, tracking error over, over, you know, anything longer than a, than a few days, um, especially if you hold them longer term. So yeah, I mean, it's, is- it's, it's not possible. They ha- it's not with, when you think tracking error, it's actually, um, it's actually the cost to carry. It's a rolling, it's a rolling cost. It's not, you know, they're perfectly priced. They just, they cost money to hold. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so uh, let's just move, let's move on to the next one, which I think is a great question. Um, and, and a lot of investors kind of have this uh, question and sometimes it comes down to the, the buying power or, you know, the buying power that you have, but Herb asks, when do you decide to go with selling a naked put versus selling a bull put vertical? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Her- Herbin. And, the, and the, the simple answer is um, if you sell the, the, the naked put, um, you obviously have a higher probability of profit and you are going to make more money and it's going to happen faster. So you have three things going in your favor. Higher probability of profit, you make more money and it happens faster. If you sell the put spread, you have defined risk. You know, in both cases, you have defined profitability, but you have defined risk that it moves slower and you make less money. So it's just a trade off. And I think Tony was talking about this earlier. He was talking about, you know, trading off the probability probabilities for the amount of money you're going to make. It's the same thing with the naked put versus the, the, versus the short put spread. Yeah. And, and naked put just, you know, has a significantly higher requirement in order to get into it. That many times is also a factor for some investors. Um, if it comes down to capital efficiency, then you have to use the put spread. Right, exactly. Uh, Gilbert is asking, I would like a discussion of management of, of a bull debit spread where the stock soars well above the short call strike very early in, in the trade. And actually, you know, I think Gilbert might be in a trade that we put out on Monday, which was unplugged. Um, we were along the 3545 vertical spread on March, going expiring in March, blew through that strike very, very quickly within a couple of days. Um, and there's a few different ways that you can play this. Uh, and, and, you know, Tom, this is really the, the best example to give, right? These are good problems to have, as I say, um, when it comes to uh, figuring out how do you want to roll or what are your options when it comes to rolling uh, a debit spread that's in the money like this. Um, sure. And this is really where, where the, the, the world is your oyster and comes when it comes to options. You have a lot of different options that you can play when you're trading, when you're trading these types of, of plays. But what is your kind of general rule of thumb when it comes to a debit spread that blows through your strike? So, and I put it up on the screen. You said you bought the 3545 in March, right? Yep. Okay. So do you remember what you paid about $4 for it, I'm guessing? Um, well, I believe we paid a little under $4 for that. Okay. Let's say you paid $3. So you pay $3 for something. It is now trade, trading at $7.60. I mean, our general rule of thumb is if you're doing a debit spread and, and there's a couple of reasons, there's a couple of reasons to get out. One is when you double your money in there. So if you pay three dollars, it goes to six dollars. That's a pretty, that's a that's generally about as good as debit spreads. I mean, this is an extraordinary move and plug. Going from the stock must have been about, let's call it forty when you did the trade, thirty-five or forty. No, under forty it had to be. It'd we we about, always buy in at the money, so it was trading okay. just around thirty-five at the time. So the stock's trading at thirty-five. It went to seventy. The chances of that happening normally is, is it's it's a, it's an extraordinary event when it happens and so when you pay three dollars for something and it ends up going to you know 760 at some point at around six dollars we would have been looking to take profits that's how we think at 760 we'd be out because at this point you're risking 760 to make 240 it doesn't make a lot of sense to us i mean there's better plays in there i would rather turn around and do something else in there if i wanted to be long plug than to keep that spread to make the last two dollars and 40 cents on it so i'd be out of this trade that'd just be me so let me ask you this right um and, and again this is where i say it's a good problem to have right because oh, you have this a lot is a of high class problem high class <laughs> problem yes exactly now um the question i think many times for for investors is really 
you know, when you have this extraordinary move to the upside and you feel that there's more room to the upside, your options for rolling. This is actually, you know, we actually just closed out this trade yesterday at 730, I think it was, um, you know, took basically about 130% return on this particular trade. But there was also the option and and partially at the time we had, we had limited options. They weren't, they didn't, um, because the move was so extreme, they didn't have the strikes listed yet. Right, right. We were going to roll them up, but we didn't have the strikes to do so. Um, now that they have listed them, you have a lot more options. From my perspective, you know, another way, and I think by by the time it reaches 70, it's a little too late. But one of the other options that you can, what you can do is rolling this whole spread higher here. If you do believe it's going to continue moving higher, which it did today. If you rolled it yesterday, you would have made further profits here to the upside. And there are a lot of options here. You can roll it just simply by moving both strikes up. You can move it by um, uh, moving just the, um, sorry, moving the uh, bo both strikes up. You can also move it out in time as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can do here to um, basically offset the risk that you took initially on the trade and continue to play for further upside in a name like plug that you might think could hit a hundred by the end, by, by March, you know, there's really at this point, uh, you know, a pretty phenomenal move to the upside. I mean, if this is the trade you have on, remember the nice thing about tasty too, is that if you have this trade on the 35, 45, so this is, this is the opposite trade here, the 35, 45 on this platform, all you have to do is one click and it will sell this out and you can choose, you know, I mean, the problem here is that you're already in March. So you would have to go to June. Right. So if you're going out to June, the trade, the spreads are going to get a little cheaper in June, but let's say you did want to roll up something like that. Um, you'd probably roll up to like, I'm guessing you sold it for seven. If it was today, let's just say, cause I can only look at today. You do the 60, 70. Um, yeah. Like, like that, like this is an example of the roll up. You'd sell it out in the front month for seven sixty, and you'd turn around and use three dollars and ninety cents of it, which was essentially your profits on the last trade, and roll it up to the sixty seventy in June. I mean that that's rolling it up and out, and that would still keep you in the game if you wanted to. I mean, I would do what you did, which is just take profits. Yeah, that's what we ended up doing here. So that's um, the right move. That's the right move. Um, I'm glad that you agree. Um, so next question from Reed, which is on straddles. He's asking, what's the best way to close out a straddle if, and, and I'm guessing what he's asking for is, and he's saying, what's the best way to close out a straddle if you do not want to get assigned? So I, what he means is selling a straddle where it moves obviously to one, uh, moves a fair amount to one side where you're at, you're concerned about an assignment risk, which I would argue is relatively low if you close it out 21 days from expiration. But let's just walk through kind of your view your thoughts around management of a straddle. Maybe we can pull up the, the NEO trade that we had before as an example. If we sold that NEO trade and the stock continues to rally higher here, how do you manage that? I think at the time we were selling the February $60, $60 straddle. Yep. Yeah, Looks sure. like that's the one that you have up. Yeah. Yep. So, so let's just say the stock works its way higher here. And so at this point now, in you're short the 60 puts and you're short the 60 calls, but let's say the stock goes all the way up to 80, right? So now you're like, oh boy, oh boy, that's not that's not good for me. The stock at 80. So you're short the calls um, at 60 and the stock's at 80 and you're short the puts at 60. So you have to make a decision on how you want to manage this this straddle. So, and I'm not worried about exercise right now because there's plenty of plenty of things to do, but you are worried about your delta on your position because now, you're, now your options have gotten way out of whack. Your puts aren't worth that much and your calls are worth you know $25. So what we do at that point is we take these puts and we just roll them up here. So I'm gonna get rid of this call strike just to show you. And we're gonna buy back this put strike and then we're gonna sell out like this strike. So this is how we do the trade. So you're staying short these calls at the 60 strike, but we're buying back the 60 puts and we're selling the 80 puts. What that's going to leave us in is, oops, sorry, did the wrong one. What that's going to leave us in is the 60 80 strangle inverted. So you short the in the money put and the in the money call. That's where that will leave us. That's my adjustment to, to his question. So we started out with this position. The stock rallied up $20. We roll the puts up $20, leave the calls. That's how we adjust it. And then you close this later on. So you're going to do this spread for a credit. You're going to take, when you do this originally, 
you did it for a $15 credit. Let's just say you roll this put spread up, you're gonna do it for another couple of bucks. So that $15 goes to let's say 20, and then you're hoping that eventually it you know, comes close to 20. You've already got loss at that point. So you're just, you're trying to you know, mitigate the loss and manage your position. Right. Um, so this would still likely end in a loss, but a smaller loss by rolling it up. Yes. Hoping the stock came back in between these strikes. Exactly. Yeah. At that point, you're playing, you're slow to play defense here. If this is your original position, the 60 shorts, the short 60 straddle and the stock moves up, let's say $10, we roll the puts up to the seventies and then the stock rolls up another $10 we roll the puts up to 80. So there's two different credits you collect in there. Maybe you collect another $5 in the process. So you've reduced your risk by $5 and you're hoping the stock has some, you know, a little bit of a pullback. That's all you're hoping for. I don't right. know what else you can do. You're absolutely right. I, I, other than just flat out closing your taking. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. There's that's always, right. that's always right. the other option. Just flat out closing. Right. Exactly. Um, great. So Turner said last time, Tom, you said you, pr you primarily review your portfolio based on deltas. You actually talked a little bit about the ratio yeah. Of, of deltas uh, in your portfolio. And he's asking, could you elaborate a little bit as far as how you use that to, to, to manage your portfolio? Yes, now we're only talking portfolios. This is Taylor, right? Uh, Turner. Turner, Turner. So Turner, we're only talking portfolios now. What I do in my portfolio, and it's easy on, on very easy on Tasty, is that I look at my portfolio um, all day long. I look at my total deltas. Now on Tasty, we beta weight the deltas to the S&P. So you could have 50 different positions on. I have, I have 80 or 90 different positions on. And I take all my deltas, it's done automatically for you. And they're beta weighted to the S&P, to the SPY. And it will show my, my position in SPY deltas. And then let's just say it's negative 2000 as an example. So that makes, I'm short 2000 SPY deltas and then I will compare that number to my theta number. And hopefully my theta number is greater than that 2000. And that would be my, that's how I manage my, the totality of my position is I look at my overall deltas to make sure they're not too high. They're not too low. They're exactly where I want them or they're close enough. And I look at that relative to my theta number and that's all I need to see. And what's the ratio that you said that you- that I mean, you... right now I'm one to two. Delta to theta. I'm one short delta to two positive theta. That means I'm short delta, short premium, which the positive, the positive theta is, a short, is the result of being short premium. That means I'm collecting decay every single day. So if I have, if I have 2,000 short delta in the SPY, I'm long $4,000 a day in decay. Very interesting. Um, and so if your deltas get out of whack, you would then reduce or add positions so that your deltas get back in line with based on the amount of theta that you're collecting. Exactly. Rolling up puts, reducing the size of the position, adding, adding some long positions. Absolutely. Great. Thank, thank you so much for that. I think that's exactly what Turner was looking for. Um, William is asking, I know Tom is a fan of short strangles. Um, what does he do when a start when the leg starts to trade in the money. This is actually very similar to the straddle yeah. question that we just answered. Um, I would imagine that you have very similar views yeah. as to how you manage a strangle as you would a straddle. Same, same exact thing that we just did on that straddle. Um, you're rolling up the untested side until you get to the at the money, until you, until you neutralize about half the deltas. I had problem children today in, just to give you an example, Baidu was a stock that moved outside the range. They had to roll up puts plug, I had a strangle in, I had to roll up puts, um, um, thinking what else today do we roll Fugo, Fugo, I think is it, it is F-U-G-O. Um, yeah. and there was one more stock, which I, I, I just can't think of. Oh, oh, a stitch fix SFIX. So those are four stocks today where I have, a, I had strangles on where they had outside outsized moves. And in all of them, I had to roll the puts up and to reduce my deltas by half. And in all four of those, you know, I lost money on the positions, but I reduced my risk by half by rolling up the puts during the course of the day. And, um, and actually, I just had a thought here, and I think this is hopefully helpful for investors on, on the previous 
um, question, which is re regarding, you know, the portfolio delta versus the, the theta. You know, a lot of investors that are here like to sell option strategies, whether you're selling credits, red strangles, iron condors. So many of you have sh uh, positive theta portfolios, if you will. Um, but many times, you know, I see investors that load up on positions to get to that positive theta. And I think what Tom is suggesting is that you keep in mind what your overall net exposure on your portfolio is to the market's move by looking at that delta number so that you don't have outsized delta exposure for the amount of theta that you're seeking or the amount of theta that you're actually collecting on a daily basis. Yeah, and we're making it a little more complicated than it, you know, that it, I mean, we're, we're using a lot of a lot of option terminology, but it's actually, it, it takes you about three minutes to figure that out. Like, it's not right. like, this is not, this is, it sounds like it's complex, but it's not that complex. Yeah, not with today's I, I technology. I completely agree. Um, Karun is asking a great question. What are the factors that you look at for selecting leaps? Uh, could you please show how Tastyworks platform is used to select leaps? So why don't we use a trade that we've been talking about for a while, which is GM. I've, I love GM. For those of you that like electric vehicles, this is one of my top picks on this particular play. It's not trading at crazy valuations. It's some, like some of the Chinese startups and I think has a, a good, a, a good long-term view here for for GM. So this is a stock that I would like that that let's take a look at some leaps on uh, on GM. Now, I would start with the January 2020, you know, options as far as an expiration date, but Tom, why, why don't we start on the expiration dates first? Well, okay. So I'm not a I don't do a lot of leaps, and so if I was going to do a leap here, I mean, the furthest I would go out would be January of of 2022. I mean, I just don't, I don't like being out longer than, you know, one year would be the absolute max. And I rarely trade that long. I mean, for me, 180 days is a long time. The, 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 the 90 to 120 would be, would be, I would say, if I'm going to go, go the distance, that's usually where it is. Um, 90 to 120 would be as long as I go. I mean, 180 occasionally and a year would be super rare and very random for me. But if you were to go leaps in GM, and you, you have this long-term bullish perspective, which I'm completely fine with. Um, January 20, I go January, 2022. I don't go further yeah. than that. Yeah. And there's now, plenty, there's plenty of volume in here, by the way. And, and you always, here's one other thing, Tony, about leaps. If you have the choice, you would like to stick to January's because the majority of leaps are January. Yep. Generally speaking, most people trade January. That's why you're going to see this week, which is expiration week, be the most, you know, the busiest and most active because this is the January leaps are expiring now. That's why there's all this volume. Right. And, you know, my philosophy on leaps have changed a little bit over the years. You know, I used to go for a slightly higher delta, somewhere in the 70 delta range here. So for that would be about the 42 strike price here on GM. Mm -hmm. um, but I've actually recently migrated a little bit lower delta to get a little bit more convexity, you know, pay a little bit less premium, take on a little less risk on the overall trade. You know, that's been, uh, you know, some shifts that I've had. I don't know if you have thoughts in terms of selecting strike prices on a longer dated uh, option like this. I, I assume that when you buy leaps, you're selling something near term against it. You're doing what I, we call, you know, a diagonal or a poor man's covered call type of thing. Exactly. Okay, so in that case, I I do not like this, the seventy delta is a little too big for me. I prefer yeah. around fifty. Right. So I prefer um, the at the money strike. So in, like in the case of GM, I would probably do like the fifty strike. Stock's forty eight. I'd probably do around the fifty strike, and then that would give me more. Um, you know, and then I would go back to you know back to like let's call it February or March, probably March in this case, and I'd be probably selling the fifty fives. Right. Um, five, so, yeah. Karun, I hope that that answered your question for you. Um, you know, I, I definitely have changed my philosophy on these longer dated options to use that, 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 you know, at the money option as opposed to that deeper in the money option that a lot of investors tend to favor because of the lower 
theta or the lower time decay, mm -hmm. hoping that they are effectively doing a stock replacement strategy, which still provides you with a fair amount of leverage compared to the capital that would require you to buy 100 shares of the stock um, and, and simply be happy as, as a stock replacement with leverage um, and not paying a lot of premium. Yeah, we call that trade the poor man's covered call. And yeah. and I it, it has a very, um, well, especially in this market, bull market, but it has a very high success rate it, it is low risk, low reward, high success exactly. rate. Um, and, and the one thing I will say about poor man's cover call, it's even more important to manage poor man, uh, a poor man's cover call before expiration and roll them ahead of expiration rather than holding them towards expiration because you could get yourself into a bit of trouble uh, on a poor man's cover call if you get assigned early on that. 21 days, don't even, no hero crap. 21 days, move on to the next trade, collect more premium. You don't want to, yeah. you don't, if you're letting that front month option go down to zero, you're waiting way too long for a roll. Exactly. Um, Bob is asking a question, two questions about IRAs at Tasty. Do you permit IRA case to, IRA accounts to write cash secured puts and or uncovered calls? We, we, we're the only firm that supports all of that. So we allow you to do cash secured. Um, we allow you to sell anything you want, futures, futures options, and listed equity and index options. They can be the puts or calls. They're, they're, they're essentially cash secured, but you can sell strangles, you can sell straddles in your IRA account at Tasty. We're the only firm that lets you do that, that I know of. Perfect. Um, Job is asking what I think is probably one of the most, most important questions for success in terms of trading is, you know, how does Tom deal with trading psychology? How do you gain confidence to get in the game, manage losses, et cetera? You know, I talk a lot about trading psychology, doing this for the past 15 years. I have seen some spectacular account blowups. I have seen some very disciplined players, uh, uh, traders, you know, be successful at trading and seeing the differences between how traders manage their psychology and the rules around trading. So, and I know that you're a very, dis uh, you're very rules-based in terms of your approach. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your thoughts in terms of trading psychology and how important that is for, for your trading. Yeah, I'm a bad trader psychology person. Um, <laughs> if, there's, if there's a weakness, um, it has to do with the trader psychology side. I am very mechanical and I am very rules-based, but I am not big on the trader psychology. Um, I, I don't have a lot of perspective there. I, I, I tend to think that, you know, like for certain people that, that may be very helpful and it may, it may calm them down. It may, it may give them peace of mind. It may give them confidence. Um, I'm a very confident trader and just, I'm, I'm confident in what I know. Let's put it that way. And so I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on trader psychology. I've always kind of blown it off for, for better or for worse, for good or bad, whatever it is. Um, it's definitely, I would be the wrong person to ask for, um, uh, marriage advice and trader psychology. <laughs> you should stay away from, from all, all those kind of Tom questions are not good ones for me. <laughs> well, I would argue that having mechanical rules is probably one of the more, um, one of the more useful parts of trading psychology, or, or sorry, the, the more, um, I would say, useful tools of managing trading psychology, because the biggest problem is when investors are emotionally attached to a trade and make decisions purely based on emotion or based on the size of their gain or loss that they're currently experiencing in their portfolios, as opposed to having black and white rules that dictate when they get out of a trade, you know, cutting losers at a certain time, taking profits at certain times, you know, as opposed to looking at the ticks on your platform and effectively sweating it, trying to decide which, you know, which, what you're going to do. I think that is trading psychology is, is saying that I have a set of mechanical rules and that dictates how I determine I get in and out of my trades. So, you know, I, I think that while you, you may sell yourself a little short on that front, I do think that you are a, a strong believer in mechanical rules. And that's really, you know, how, how you can build discipline is, are, are, are these rules and building confidence is, is saying that I have a set of rules and I follow it and I don't let my emotions dictate, you know, whether I cut my losses on a trade or not. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm reasonably disciplined. I've I've gone through stages where I'm very undisciplined. I'm reasonably disciplined, but I am, and I'm definitely mechanical. But I don't spend a lot of. I, I understand how you're blending the two. I I don't consider myself a, you know, a big <laughs> fan of like kind of classic trader psychology. I I I I try not to overthink things. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we're all human, um, and we we're not robots, um, and and emotions always come into some aspect of our trading. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of questions before we wrap up here. Uh, you know, Wayne is asking, in creating an iron condor, what deltas do you use for each side? I mean, it's a great question, and Wayne, we've done a lot of research on this, and um, the the there it de- a little bit depends on the stock price, but if you're looking for a default. Your short delta should be around the 25 strike, around the 25 delta. I'm sorry. So if you're just if you're if you're looking at a stock like GM, it could be hard at the 25 delta. On on a bigger stock like Facebook or Apple or Netflix or you know Amazon or whatever it is, you might an Amazon you might want to go down to the 16 delta. But generally speaking, you are looking to collect at the 25 delta. You want to collect no more than 40 percent of the width of the strikes, and you'd like to collect around. 35% of the width of the strikes. So the 25 Delta will usually get you in that territory. So, and you're saying that you would choose your, your out, your, um, your buy strikes based on trying to collect roughly 35%. That's, of that, the, that's of the right. Price. Now the statistically speaking, you're better. If you're, if you're an iron condor lover, you're better off going wider and collecting a little bit less width of the strikes as, as a, as a credit. So like, if you told me I went to the 25 Delta, I widened the strikes out and I got down to only, you know, 20 or 25% of the width of the strikes, I'd be totally fine with that. It's statistically a better trade, but, and if you start at the 20 Delta short strike, that's fine too, but I just wouldn't go much higher than the 30 strike under any circumstances. Great. Um, thank you for your insights on that. And lastly, this is the last question we have here for today. Eddie asks, for those of you that uh, that for those who avoid earnings plays, and I don't know if you play if you trade earnings, uh, you know, typically here um, we do a lot of I, I I personally do a lot of earnings plays. I like playing them. Um, what is the ideal window of time before or after the earnings date that one should take a position in the underlying? So I guess before, if you do like to play earnings, how far how far in advance do you get into the trade? And if you like to avoid earnings, how far after the earnings announcement do you get back into a trade? Well, first of all, as soon as the earning announcement is over the next day, you can get back in the trade because the earnings announcement is instantaneous with respect to the the um, contraction and volatility It's instantaneous. So wherever the stock opens after earnings um, within the next hour or two, you can get back in because the, the damage has been done one way or the other. Um, as far as putting on earnings trades, and I do trade a lot of earnings stocks, my preference for putting on earnings trades is the same day that the earnings are coming out. Like, I don't think you get too much of an advantage doing it, you know, a day before. Sometimes you get a little bit of advantage the day before, sometimes it works negatively. I prefer the same day for earnings trades. I have no problem putting a position on two weeks before, three weeks before, or one week before, but I don't consider it an earnings trade per se. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. I mean, this is really why we love doing these sessions with you, Tom. You know, I, I, I just want to say thank you so much for your time this afternoon. This was really helpful, I think, for a lot of investors. I think today we went through some really great examples. Oh, it was awesome, man. It was awesome, really, Tom. That's great. Yeah, I love, I, I love doing this. It's a great way for our investors to learn more about just the different scenarios and how you handle them. And it's always great to have a different perspective as to, yeah. you know, how you choose your strategies. And like I said, the, the world of options is vast. There are a lot of options for you. You don't have to necessarily stick to just one strategy, but it's important that you understand what are the best practices and where do you generally want to start from an optimal perspective based on back test. You know, you can make minor adjustments to them and, and largely have the same results as long as you understand what impact your adjustments have on your trading strategy. Um, so with that, before we wrap this up, I just wanna say thank you so much for Tom, but I also have an exclusive offer from Tastyworks on the screen here. You can get 100 shares on Tasty. If you open up an account using this link here on your screen, which I will share to everyone here on your platform. And for those of you that submitted questions here during the Q&A session, 130, 13, 103 questions answered during our session here today. And I hope Tom and I answered a lot of your questions that were submitted by users. Um, so with that, Tom, um, 
just any closing statements before we wrap up here for the day? No, I, thanks so much. This was awesome. And, and my, my only thing is Tony, my email is, is Tom at tasty trade. So if somebody wants to ask me a question about what we talked about today, because every time after I do a, a session with you, um, my emails light up and I've got, you know, I get a, Tony said this and, and I thought, I think I heard you say this and I'm just curious about this. And I love the feedback and all the questions. It's so great. And I send you a bunch of them too. So, um, you know, if anybody wants to reach out, that's cool. And until next time, you know, I hope we do this forever. This is awesome. I, I will, I will, we'll set something up for the next. We'll, we'll communicate to everyone the next schedule. We usually do this every two months or so. So looking forward to seeing how the market shapes up in the next two months and discussing some new trade ideas then. So until then, everyone, thank you so much. Have a great trading day and we'll see you guys next month or and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Otherwise have a great night. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tom.